Good morning, everybody. I'd also like to say that we are fortunate to have Simon Merna with us this morning, who's one of our policy colleagues for LBTT policy from Scottish Government. So anything policy-wise, we might be lucky enough to get pass that over to Simon. So today's going to cover the ADS review, Scottish Government consultation, litigation, common issues arising, the new guidance, and as Nathan said, an opportunity to ask questions. We have asked for questions in advance, so we have a couple there, but if time permits, we will take anything that comes up in the chat. So today's session is going to cover, right, sorry, rather the, the ADS review is covering timelines, inherited property, small shares, divorce or separation, joint buyers economic unit provisions and local authorities. Point to note that the current legislation still applies, nothing has changed as yet and although the consultation has closed, the Scottish Government are now considering responses and any changes needed for the proposed clauses. So the next step for that is laying the Scottish statutory instruments and the timeline for that has yet to be confirmed. So I'm just going to go over a couple of um, brief basic examples for the ADS just to refresh everybody's understanding of that. So replacing a main residence. Pink and orange are selling their main residence, house one, and purchasing a new dwelling to use as their next main residence. The purchase of their new dwelling happens on the same day as the sale of their previous main residence. So at the end of the effective date, Pink and Orange own one dwelling and so they will not pay the ADS. This is a straightforward transaction with the sale and purchase both taking place on the effective date. No ADS is due. Move on to the next example. ADS not replacing a main residence. Yellow owns two dwellings. House one is Yellow's main residence, but they also own a buy-to-let dwelling. Yellow sells House 1 in November and on the same day purchases a new dwelling, House 2. However, they do not intend to use House 2 as their new main residence. They still own their buy-to-let dwelling. Although Yellow owns two dwellings at the end of the effective date and Yellow has replaced their previous main residence, they do not intend to live in House 2 as their own later main residence and so the ADS will apply. In this example, House 2 is not a replacement for the previous main residence, therefore the ADS is due. And this is covered in Schedule 2A under 22C. So I'm going to now move on to our final example, which is a replacement of the previous main residence in the last 18 months. In June, Red sells their main residence, which is House 1. Red also owns a holiday home, House 2. Since the sale of their previous main residence, Red has been living in rented accommodation, but still owns their holiday home. In February, Red purchases a dwelling, House 3, which they intend to use as their new main residence. They move out of their rented accommodation. Red still owns a holiday home, House 2. At the end of the effective date, Red owns two dwellings, but they are replacing their previous main residence by moving into a new main residence, House 3. The sale of House 1 took place in the previous 18 months. The ADS will not apply. So as Red's previous main residence was sold nine months before the effective date, this meets the condition for replacing a main residence. Therefore, the ADS doesn't apply. And that's covered by Schedule 2A, Para 2, Condition A. So I'm now going to pass over to Molly, who's going to talk about repayment conditions. Thanks, Rona, and good morning, everyone. Um, so Rona's just gone through some examples of whether the ADS would apply in the first instance, but the rest of this um, presentation is actually going to look at the repayment conditions, which is where we see a lot of our email traffic and queries coming from. So on the screen here are the paragraph eight repayment conditions. So 
all of these conditions need to be met by the buyer in order for a repayment to be made by Revenue Scotland. So the first one here is that within the period of 18 months, beginning with the day after the effective date of the transaction, the buyer disposes of their ownership of a dwelling. And the bit in brackets here is really important. This will come up again later on, but it's something that we see happen quite commonly is that it has to be one other than what formed part of the subject matter of the transaction. So in other words, you can't sell the residence that you have bought within the 18 month period um, and still get the repayment. It has to be the disposal of a different dwelling. The second condition here is that the dwelling that you have sold must have been your only or main residence during 18 months before the effective date of the transaction. And lastly, the dwelling that you have purchased needs to have been occupied as your only or main residence since. So those are the paragraph eight repayment conditions. And what I'm going to do is talk you through the common themes that we see arising through litigation, because the litigation that we've had to date pretty much illustrates the main things that we see come up again and again. So repayment condition A, which is the one I spoke about where you have to dispose of your ownership of a, another dwelling. Um, the issues that we see arising here are, as I mentioned, the new main residence being sold, you will not be able to seek repayment in that instance because it has to be other than one that was or formed part of the subject matter of the transaction. We have um, people falling out with the statutory timelines. So a property may have been disposed of, but it's not within the 18 month period that's stipulated in the legislation. And then we have another case which is a little bit more niche, but it has come up in tribunal, so we will go through it. And it looks at where you are converting two properties into one. So you're, you're residing in one property, you've bought the house next door, you're knocking it through, converting it into one, um, and you wouldn't get the repayment in this case because there hasn't been a disposal of an ownership of a dwelling. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. In relation to condition B, so this is the one where um, the dwelling that you have disposed of needs to have been your only or main residence during the period of 18 months ending with the effective date of the transaction. The most common issues that we see arising here is, um, again, falling out with the statutory timelines. So you may have resided in that property as your only or main residence at one time, but it's not within the 18 month period. And some of our litigation covers military service or working overseas. Um, and as you'll see, um, unfortunately, there is no um, carve out for these situations. It is simply have you resided in that property in the 18 month prior period. We also see issues arising around own your main and the interpretation of that. Our guidance has recently been updated around this that hopefully provides further, um, further support of Revenue Scotland's views in terms of what we would look at and the evidence that we would require to support the fact that um, you have resided in that property as your own your main residence. But this does come up time and time again. And we also have further issues that present themselves in the context of joint buyers, which I will I will come on to. So that might be where um, both joint buyers need to have resided in the previous property as their own your main residence, and only one of them can do that. And there's also the situation where you have joint buyers who each own a dwelling and only one of themselves before the effective date and the other one thereafter. And in that case, again, you're in a position where it's very difficult to meet the repayment conditions. And then repayment condition C, a little bit more straightforward, but we do still see issues here. It's that the new main residence has to been have been occupied as your own your main residence. So we see situations where that isn't the case. They've bought a dwelling and actually they haven't resided in it as their own your main residence and they can't get the repayment. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about paragraph 8A, which was brought in in 2017. And this made amendments to the ADS legislation in very specific circumstances. So if there are two buyers and they are spouses, civil partners or cohabitants and they are jointly buying a new property, um, then paragraph 8A can apply. 
Um, and as it says on the slide there, two buyers are treated as cohabitants if they live together as though married to one another. So if this is the case and, and those conditions are met, then paragraph 8A changes to that either of you dispose of a dwelling. So it doesn't have to be both of you, only one of you needs to do it. But both of you have to have resided in that property as your own your main residence in the relevant period. And you both have to have been residing in the new property as your new main residence. And this is where the joint buyer rules often um, cause issues, is that specifically at repayment condition B there, both buyers are not able to prove that they have lived in that property as their own your main residence. And that's the first one that I'm going to come on to just now. So the issue here is that one of one of the buyers did not reside in the PMR disposed of as their own your main residence. And you can see here these are the different tribunal cases that Revenue Scotland have seen um, go to the first tier tribunal. Um, all of which have been decided in Revenue Scotland's favour and it is simply because there is no evidence to support the fact that both joint buyers have resided in the PMR disposed of as their own your main residence. So I'm just going to talk through a few examples and there's no visuals for this so hopefully I explain them well enough but there's it's just trying to illustrate the difference between paragraph 8 on its own and paragraph 8a. So when paragraph 8 applies and you have joint buyers and paragraph 8a doesn't apply, let's say because there's more than two buyers or you're not civil partners, spouses or cohabitants. So paragraph 8a doesn't apply, but paragraph 8 does. All buyers need to meet the repayment conditions and you need to meet all three of them. Every single buyer needs to meet all of them. And that's because of... Um, Section 48 of the LBTT Act, which states that anything required or authorised to be done in relation to the buyer must be done by or in relation to all of them. So if 8A doesn't apply to you, each of the repayment conditions have to be met by each of the buyers that are buying the, the new property. So let's take an example then. So you've got Red, who owns their current main residence, and they look to soon buy a new main residence with green and they're going to buy that property jointly, but they're not cohabitants, spouses or civil partners. So paragraph 8A can't apply. And green currently lives in separate rented accommodation. Come the effective date, red cannot sell their previous main residence. So at the end of that date, red owns two dwellings, hasn't replaced their PMR and the ADS applies because if any of the joint buyers own more than one dwelling, and haven't replaced their own your main, then the ADS would apply. So they pay the ADS on the effective date as they should. But subsequently, five months later, Red sells their PMR and they now wish to claim a repayment of the ADS. Now, as I said previously, Section 48 applies here. So each of the joint buyers need to have been able to meet the repayment conditions. And yes, Red has sold a property, but Green hasn't. Green can't meet the repayment criteria. And this is where you have issues arising. I'm just going to go back a slide. Um, in this bottom bullet point here, where you've got joint buyers who separately own dwellings and one of them sells their PMR before and one of them sells after. Well, if paragraph 8A doesn't apply to you, you're not going to be able to meet the repayment conditions because, again, section 48 means that you have to apply it across the board. Um, whereas 8a let's take let's take a, a another example but looking at 8a so only one buyer would need to dispose of a property but you both need to have lived there so let's let's take another example so red again they own their current main residence and they're looking to buy a new main residence with green jointly but this time they are spouses so paragraph 8a can apply so only two buyers they're joint buyers and they are spouses and again, Green currently lives in separate rented accommodation. Or Red can't sell their PMR again, so they pay the ADS on the effective date. But Red manages to sell their PMR five months later, just as they did in the first example, and they wish to make a claim for the repayment of the ADS. Now, condition A can be met in this case because only one of you needs to have sold um, a property. But 
you both need to have resided in it. And as Green lived in separate rented accommodation, Green will not be able to provide the evidence to Revenue Scotland to support the fact that um, the property that Red resided in was also their own or main residence. So unfortunately, in that case, the ADS repayment also could not be given. It could be given, however, if they had resided together in that property and they are intending or are using the new main residence as their own or main residence jointly. So that's just a little bit about how paragraph 8 and paragraph 8a are slightly different and why it's really important to see whether paragraph 8a applies in your specific circumstances. But I'll just go on now. So taking um, these five decisions, six decisions, sorry, um, that have taken place, some of the key decisions that have come through from the tribunal are that the ADS legislation was intended to be tightly drawn. Paragraph 8a is workable and the policy intent is plain, that it is restricted to very, very specific circumstances. Um, the tribunal is unable to consider arguments related to fairness, just behaviours, reasonableness. This will come up time and time again. It's something that the tribunal quite often reminds um, taxpayers and Revenue Scotland that, that they are confined to the powers conferred to them by statute, which is to look at the facts of the case and the application of the law. Section 48 is a general provision. Um, in regard to obligations and liabilities under the Act, and it is not disapplied by paragraph 5 of Schedule 2A. And again, coming back to the policy objective of paragraph 8A being introduced, it was to ensure that where the title to a former main residence of a taxpayer is in the sole name of a married couple, so of a partnership or cohabitants who both lived in that property and then jointly buy a new main residence, then the ADS can be repaid and relief given, but it's only in those very specific circumstances. Um, the criteria for liability to the ADS and repayment are different, and this is something that comes up again and again um, that is really crucial, I guess, to understand, is that whether the ADS applies in the first instance, like the examples that Rona talked us through, um, the test for that is different to the test of whether or not a repayment can be given um, and they are separated in the legislation. So paragraph 5 of Schedule 2A looks at whether the ADS is due in the first place um, it's not then mirrored in relation to the repayment conditions um, and if Parliament had intended for them to have been mirrored they would have mirrored them and that's what the tribunal is saying here. That's not what Parliament did. And the repayment conditions are stipulated in paragraph 8 and 8A, and that's what's looked at. Um, I did just want to very quickly go back to a point that was raised in Doherty here. So that case also confirmed that a main residence must be owned by at least one of the buyers. So it doesn't cover rented property. Um, and that's where you're looking at whether there's been... Um, a disposal of a previous main residence or the replacement of a previous main residence. It doesn't apply to rented accommodation. It's only where there's actually ownership in place. So I know I probably talked through that quite quickly. Um, hopefully that made sense in terms of the distinction between paragraph 8 and paragraph 8a and also illustrated the difference between the repayment criteria as opposed to whether the ADS actually applies in the first case. But I'm going to pass back to Rona now, who's going to talk through some other common issues that we see arising that have been illustrated by um, first tier tribunal cases. OK, so we're going to start off with one of those niche situations where we have only had the one case and it's amalgamation of two properties. So it's a disposal doesn't include amalgamation, combination of two into a single property. Um, the tribunal have said that they've gone by the dictionary meaning of dispose, um, which doesn't include um, amalgamation. Disposal is a sale or a transfer of the property. If, however, this had been accepted as a disposal, we would still be in the situation if the PMR would have become part of the dwelling that was the subject matter of the chargeable transaction. And so, again, it wouldn't meet the, the repayment condition for Condition A. 
So I'll just run through an example of that with you. We have blue and orange own two Leatherhead Drive. They subsequently purchase 2A Leatherhead Drive, which is the basement flat of two Leatherhead Drive, separate dwellings, although they had originally formed one dwelling. So since the purchase, Blue and Orange have carried out work to reintegrate the two houses into one and to consolidate titles on the land register. And the effective date of purchasing 2A, they pay the ADS as they own two dwellings at the end of this date. They seek repayment as they claim that the additional dwelling supplement which was purchased no longer exists. The buyers have not disposed of the ownership of the dwelling, so the repayment conditions can't be met. <coughs> so if we can just move on to the, the timelines. So the, the timelines we have um, in the schedule are 18 months. But please note that 18 months was extended to 36 months if the effective date fell between the 24th of September 2018 and 24th March 2020 due to COVID provisions. Um, out with these dates, however, there is no flexibility to the 18-month timeline. So the, the area that changed for the COVID provisions was under 8B subparagraph 2. And it just changed the, the repayment conditions where whether the, re, the ADS can be repaid. Condition A was changed to 36 months. We can just move on to that next timelines. So we've had four cases that applied to tribunal with regard to the timelines where disposal was either prior to the effective date or after the effective date, but all four were out with the the relevant timelines and as there's no exceptional circumstances, no no wriggle room anywhere, whether for tribunal or for ourselves to to go out with these times. And just move on to the the new main residence. So we've got new main residence disposed of. The dwelling disposed of at paragraph 81A must be one other than the one that formed part of the subject matter of the transaction. In other words, the new main residence. So the dwelling disposed of to meet the first of the repayment conditions must be one that was formed. <coughs> must be one that one that formed part of the subject matter of the transaction. So again, we have no discretion by either Revenue Scotland or Tribunal for that one can move on to the, the next one there. So we've had four situations where that's been the case. But in situations where the new purchase is disposed of, not only does it fail the first of the repayment conditions, it would not be able to meet the second and possibly the third of those conditions either. B being the dwelling that was the buyer's only or main residence at any time during the period of 18 months ending with the effective date. So if they've sold the new main residence, that was never their main residence prior to the effective date. And condition C, the dwelling that was or formed part of the subject matter of the transaction, has been occupied as the buyer's only or main residence. Again, if that's the, the dwelling that's been sold, that's never been their main residence at any time. So condition C wouldn't be met there either. If we can move on to only or main residence. So we have only our main residence. The property disposed of must have been the buyer's only or main residence at any time during the period of 18 months ending with the effective date of the transaction. This is the same issue as presented under paragraph 8A, but in isolation to one buyer. If the dwelling disposed of cannot be evidenced as being the only or main residence of the buyer, repayment condition can't be met. Again, there is no uh, discretion or exceptional circumstances to consider either by Revenue Scotland or by Tribunal. We are open to the types of evidence that can be provided for this, but evidence must be available to show that that dwelling was a main residence. Now, if I can just move on to that next bit, I'll explain a little bit more about um, what we would accept as only our main residence. So your main residence is usually where you have most of your possessions. 
where your family lives, uh, if you're married or in a civil partnership, or live with your children, where you're registered for various organisations such as banks, GPs, insurance companies, clubs and societies. If you do have children, they go to school from, from that dwelling where you're registered to vote. Um, we do accept that you may spend less time in your main residence than in another residence. For example, if, if you work away or study away, we accept that you could be away Monday to Friday and you only use your main residence at weekends. We also accept that that could be for a, a period of time, but your main residence would still have all your registrations, all your personal accounts, things like that. So these types of things will be taken into their account for the purposes of determining your only or main residence. But we do have to say that there is a difference between spending less time in your only or main residence than spending no time in the property at all. And that property must be available for you. If you've rented that out, that in effect makes that property not available to be used as your main residence. So it's highly unlikely that a property can be viewed as your only or main residence if you've spent no time there at all in the 18 months period, or, if the, or as I say, if the property was rented out during that period. And if we could move on to the, the next slide. So this one's new main residence occupied as only our main residence. We are we found ourselves in situations where taxpayers have never resided in the new main residence. This again is similar to the new main residence being disposed of rather than the previous main residence. And there are situations where the new purchase has never been used as the only or main residence will fail to meet the repayment conditions. And that's condition C, the dwelling that was or formed part of the subject matter of the transaction has been occupied as the buyer's only or main residence. And this is consistent with other tribunal cases. There can be no consideration of fairness or exceptional circumstances in relation to why that new main residence was never used as a main residence. But that's not to say that, that Revenue Scotland doesn't empathise with the various circumstances that taxpayers find themselves in, but they don't meet this repayment condition. However, we have to work within the, the provisions of the legislation that we have. Um, and I'm just going to move on to some other common issues arising. So we have inherited properties with a share value of less than 40,000. We still count these as a dwelling for determining if the ADS is due, if the whole property is worth 40,000 or more. The second one, a previous marital home, is counted as a dwelling for the purposes of paying the EDS, even if you no longer reside there. There is a difference in that point if your name has never been on the title deeds and you've now separated. That wouldn't be counted, but if you're on the title deeds and you still have ownership, that's where that one is counted. Now, those two points are being considered within the Scottish Government consultation, so there may be changes um, suggested for those two. The third point is something that we've covered briefly in the amalgamation of, of properties. So it, this one isn't buying next door and amalgamating, but this is purchasing two properties at the same time and amalgamating. The ADS will be due and the repayment conditions can only be met if the new main residence has been resided in as the only or main residence. So purchasing two properties and amalgamating them, there is an argument here that there was never any intention to use either property alone as a main, as a main dwelling and the intention being for them to become one. As more than one dwelling is being purchased, the ADS will always be applicable in these circumstances because two dwellings at least have been purchased. To meet repayment condition C, which could only be for one dwelling, the dwelling that was, that was or formed part of the subject matter of the transaction has been occupied as the buyer's only or main residence and we would require evidence to show that this condition could be met. So I'll give you an example of that one as well. Blue and Orange own two Leatherhead Drive. They subsequently purchased 3A and 3B Leatherhead Drive. 
be purchased 3A on the 1st of June 2022 and pay the ADS as they still own two dwellings. They do not move into 3A and continue to reside at two Leatherhead Drive. They purchase 3B on the 30th of June 2022 and pay the ADS on this date as they own three dwellings. They immediately, as in on the effective date, start to amalgamate the two properties into one dwelling, 3 Leatherhead Drive. They move into 3 Leatherhead Drive once construction has concluded. They then sell to Leatherhead Drive and submit two repayment claims, one for 3A and one for 3B. In this case, the buyer has disposed of the ownership of a dwelling, which was their previous main residence in the relevant period, but the dwelling that is the new main residence has not been occupied as their only or main residence, as there's never occupied either one of those two dwellings in its own right as a main residence. So we have to remember that the three points, the three conditions have to be met in all cases by all owners. So I'll just run through those again. We have A, within the period of 18 months beginning with the day after the effective date of the transaction, the buyer disposes of ownership of a dwelling other than the one that was formed part of the subject matter of the chargeable transaction. Condition B, that the dwelling was the buyer's only or main residence at any time during the period of 18 months ending with the effective date of the transaction, and C, the dwelling that was or formed part of the subject matter of the transaction has been occupied as the buyer's only or main residence. So I'm now going to pass you back on to Molly to go over our guidance. Thanks, Rona. Um, so you will be getting a copy of these slides after the presentation. So this is more really for, for that purpose, but these are links to our new guidance on the ADS. So the first one is the general guidance, gives you a little bit of information around when we would typically expect the ADS to be paid and when it could be repayable. And then the second link there is to the more technical guidance, which goes over a lot of what Rona and I have spoken about today. It gives you some examples um, and hopefully um, provides further information about whether in your specific circumstances a repayment could be claimed. And then just very quickly before we move on to the Q&A, I was just going to run through with you the legislation itself and the changes that have happened over time. So the ADS was introduced in 2016. Um, Paragraph 8A and 9A, which we haven't gone through today, um, were both introduced as part of the 2017 order. And then in 2018, um, that order was given retrospective effect. Um, the other changes to the ADS have been around rate changes and also, as Rona described, the coronavirus extension that was given um, to the 18 month period. So there have been a few changes to the um, to Schedule 2A since it came in and of course it's under review just now um, and the consultation has closed so there will be further changes coming through and our guidance will be updated accordingly afterwards um, so look out for that the, the links that I provided in the last slide will still be applicable it will just be a case of updating the the current guidance. <clears throat> 